Hi there. I'm at the Canton Art Museum to talk about watercolor painting, which is one of the art forms spotlighted by the museum. They have over 140 watercolor paintings by American artists. This landscape by Thomas Hart Benton is the kind of art that goes by the lofty name Realistic Expressionism. It's not abstract. It's not shapes and figures that represent something else. You don't have to look at it and imagine what it must be. It's very obviously a boy fishing, which incidentally is the title of the painting. But if you look at it closely, you'll see that it is not an exact reproduction of a scene. It's not like a photograph. It doesn't show things exactly as they appear in life. So it isn't real, it's sort of real. Watercolors can be used a lot in the painting of landscapes and outdoor scenes. It's a lot more flexible than acrylic or oil paints. Watercolors can be blended easily. The intensity of the color can be changed depending on how much water is used. You want thick, dark, solid color? Use less water. You want just a hint of color, a wash, use more water. Mary Kay Disa of Youngstown, Ohio, paints watercolor landscapes, and she does it using more than a paintbrush. She uses common, everyday items found around the house. Oh, and notice how she paints trees. She doesn't paint every leaf and twig. She's not concerned with details. She creates an impression of the tree. When we look at it, we know what it is, even though we don't see every line and detail. I'm going to show you a wet and wet technique right now using very little paint color. Um, I'm going to keep this to a minimum. Notice that I'm using a big brush, which every once in a while loses hair. And I'm not wetting the whole page. I'm going to wet where the color is going to be. This is burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. I'm really using only the two colors. It's very dark, and in watercolor, we can always go darker. We can't get lighter. We don't use white paint. And I'm going to make that even darker because watercolor dries lightly. Well, I had the opportunity, and this is wet. I'm going to throw salt on this wash. And that will separate as it dries and look like snow. And I think you'll enjoy seeing that. Now I'm going to work with a fan brush using these same colors and show you a little bit about working with shrubbery. Now this brush is very inexpensive and it does some interesting things. Um, I like to use some spatter particularly when I'm doing a snow scene. And I find if I turn it upside down, it doesn't seem to get into the sky as much. This is distant foliage. Try to keep it um, a little less distinct than the area in the front. Now, see how the salt is breaking this area up? It looks like a snowfall. Now, this is a palette knife. And you can also use the end of a brush, and you can pull paint out. See, I can make lighter branches. You have to wait until it's just the right consistency. The shine starts to go off the wet part of the paper. Things become more definite and brighter in the foreground, and as you go to the background, uh, they become more blue, uh, more faded out, and so forth. Um, what I'm going to use is a, a rigger brush. It's called a rigger brush because it was used to do the rigging of ships. And it's uh, got a very long point. This brush is, is wonderful for doing twigs. You have to hold it like I'm holding it, rather loosely. I want to tell you that you must brush the salt off after this is finished because it will make the paper deteriorate. It must be perfectly dry before you do that. This is a photograph of Mill Creek Park, and I'm going to show you how to do the fall foliage. This is a natural sponge, and it, makes, it has bigger holes in it, so it makes more interesting foliage. You see every color in the fall. To show 
some depth, I'm going to use some dark greens here. I'll be shaping my trees actually with the darks and also uh, giving it much more depth. This is called uh, working with negative space. So I'm working with the sponge, but I'm also working with the brush. And this is going to be some areas in the foreground. Now notice I'm just letting things run together. That's fine. Let it bleed. That's the beauty of watercolor. I'm going to work on a tree. This is raw sienna. Now this is burnt sienna, and I'm putting it right over the raw sienna. We'll say this is the under part of the limb. I don't want this to be really even. And I'm going to throw some blue and some violet in too. Trees have every color. I'll use this rigger brush again. There's just no way with another brush. And you can just keep adding. All right now for the saran wrap, I'm going to roll it so that it's striated. And if you can see the textures, it really works so well. This is the synthetic sponge. I use the natural sponge. But this sponge is great too. And it does bricks beautifully. It's nice to know some of the tricks. If you go down in the park, you just notice all the beauty in the trees. Watercolor painting is an excellent way to start exploring art. The students at Canfield Middle School painted landscapes using some of the very same techniques as Ms. Disa. The paintings actually grow. First, the faraway parts of the picture, the background, usually the sky. Next comes the middle ground, the things that are closer. Finally, the foreground is added. These are the things that are right in front. Divide your paper into thirds. That's foreground, middle ground, background, and then draw in the tree. In watercolor, you stretch the paper. Okay? And watercolor paper is almost like a paper towel. It's, it's designed to be real absorbent because of the water that you're applying on it. So it has a tendency to want to buckle, okay? So you want to tape it down onto the surface. And the first thing that we're going to do is paint in a sky. Now, we're going to do the wet on wet technique first. So what you need to do is wet your paper, okay? And I'm using quite a bit of water here, okay? But you don't, you don't see puddles on there. Okay, I'm just wetting it down. So I'm just going to take some blue, put it in here. The other thing that she made a special point of saying is let the colors bleed. Let colors bleed. That's, she said that's the beauty of watercolor, and that's true. You, want it, you can see I'm, each time I'm dipping in another color and just pulling it through. The purpose of a wet-on-wet -wet technique is so that the colors bleed together. I'm going to give you a container of salt. Okay, what I would like you to do, another technique, is to sprinkle the salt on here. It breaks up the color and you're going to see little white areas. It's real nice. I'm going to show you how this fan brush works. I'm going to take some color, okay, and just like you saw, you just get some paint on there. Look, I could put a little bit of red in there if I wanted to, okay? And I'm going to just push in an area here. See how I'm moving it, moving it around, putting some other colors in there, just kind of having some fun, experimenting with the colors. Then come back, yeah. Yeah, bring it in there, because really if it bleeds a little bit, it's, it's okay. Kind of try to mix your colors, because they look good when they're mixed. This is a palette knife, okay? And what you want to do, hopefully you remember seeing it, is just the, that would be our trunks, okay? Look how I'm, I'm not just drawing a bunch of straight lines, okay? I'm trying to give my line a little bit of character. You're painting to the foreground area all the way down to the bottom of the paper, okay? Lighter and brighter down there.
but water it down a little bit because it, you know, if it's real thick, it's not going to come off the brush. You got to have just a little bit of water, just a little bit. Go ahead and try it and see how it works. There, yeah, that works good. How about making an object look round? How do you make an object look like it's rounded? Yeah, yeah, darker on one side. There's so many little things that you that can improve your painting if you think about it. Take the saran wrap, take a piece off, crinkle it up, and when you lay it down on there and press, it will leave a texture in the tree that you could use to resemble the bark. Do you remember the shape of a rigger brush as being yeah. long and slender? Yeah. Okay. Those are, I'd like you to use this brush. I need some black. And got to get it kind of watery. The reason is you want it to flow nicely. Okay. And you can add some of it. It would be smaller branches coming off. See how they're coming off and going on? Overlap. Coming off the other parts of the tree. Now, what I did here was I, I took the sponge, okay? And I did get it wet, but you can't have it wringing wet, okay? I got to take this and get rid of that water. Wet this down a little bit. Actually, I'm just going to shove several colors together. So I'm going to dip it in this color. Just at, look at how that, all the different colors. I just kind of blended them together and pick an area. You can use it for different things. You could use this if you had a rock in your picture, if I wanted to to put some foliage in my tree, I could use it there. You know, I could just use it if this was a plowed up area or area where there was crops, I could use it in there. I mean, there's different places that you could use it. Well, I think you all did a great job on this. Had a lot of experimentation and good luck next time you watercolor. Watercolor painting has long been used for landscapes and outdoor scenes. Photographs may show us nature as it really truly exists, but watercolors in its realistic expressionist style tells us more. It shows us how the beauty of nature makes us feel. Teaching materials for sharing art are available on the web at wneo.org slash sharing art. Funding for this series was provided by the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation and Northeastern Ohio Education Association. NEOEA's members include elementary and secondary teachers, university professors, and support professionals proudly serving students attending the public schools and colleges of Northeastern Ohio.